Okay, guys, I wanted to talk about market specific due diligence. We uh, we keep getting deals submitted to us for the funding pump, uh, company, Ground Up Partners, where the deal submitter doesn't have a local realtor and is somewhere new where they haven't done a lot of business. And that just that is a great way to lose money. So I'm going to illustrate that point right now. Uh, so been business in a dozen plus states and probably 50 or 60 different markets across those states. And the norms vary dramatically. So that's the point that I'm going to make here. So let's start with septic tanks. Uh, so here, this is the first market really I ever did business in. All of these lots, these lots, approximately right there, these lots are uh, septic. There's no sewer line. And uh, I remember building houses down here in 2018, 2019, kind of learning that whole process. And people would buy these lots without any sort of soils test because there was no worry of them not being able to have a septic tank put in. Now, occasionally people would do a test or at least do just a preliminary look. Or if it's a builder, maybe they'd go dig a little, little bit themselves to make sure that it wasn't covered in shale. That's really, really hard to excavate. But for the purposes of getting the water to flow through the ground, right, percolate, uh, it was kind of a non-issue. So all these lots would trade without doing any sort of test. And so that was my point of reference around uh, uh, septic and soil testing where, eh, you know, it, it makes a little bit of a difference. Sometimes the septic tanks are more expensive, right? When you go to build, you talk to the county health department. They tell you, based on the soil, what sort of septic you're putting in, whether it's engineered or standard. And so the price does vary. But again, the norm of this market was for these to trade without any sort of test. And so I bought and sold dozens and dozens and dozens of them without any sort of testing. Then I started doing business in the Carolinas. And I had that point of reference from, uh, from Pueblo West. Well, very different here. Uh, this is the first place I did business in in. Uh, North Carolina, very, very busy and popular now. Every land investor knows of Brunswick County. I don't really mind showing it. Uh, if you start looking around listings, this area has uh, sewer, but if you start looking around areas that do not have sewer, you will see constant mention of preliminary soil evaluation or uh, septic permit on file. And that tells you right away it's really important here. In fact, you pretty much cannot sell unless your end buyer's pretty clueless, you cannot sell these lots without some sort of testing. A lot of times, at least the end buyer is going to do their own test or if it's a builder, they'll go dig around. But oftentimes they'll want to actually get the full permit via the county before closing, if not at least a preliminary soil evaluation. So if it does not have sewer, we always do a perk test here, percolation test, to at least get a preliminary idea of whether it'll perk. And then we have that letter from the soil scientist when we go to resell. And I learned that lesson the hard way. So what's the point? Well, the point is the norms vary dramatically from market to market. If I took the norms from Pueblo West and I applied them here, I could get myself in trouble. And I did. I bought some shitty lots that did not perk. <laughs> so learn from my mistakes. One more example. I don't remember what city this was, but we had a submission in Arkansas where the lot had failed a perk test. And I thought, oh, okay, so it's not really worth much. And the realtor we were talking to there who had done a lot of business, sold a lot of land, just goes, oh, no, we can just do a, a slightly more expensive septic tank. I forget what it was called. I forget what the engineering looked like. But in that market, it was basically meaningless. <laughs> so again, I didn't know that until I found the local expert. So it's kind of twofold where anywhere new, we always find a local expert. And at the same time, we're continually building our market specific due diligence sheet, which has Brunswick County, Pueblo West, et cetera. And it lists all the specificities that you have to check for those specific metros. Okay. So one other aside, you can always get a lot to perk. There's no such thing as a lot that won't perk. The issue is is it worth the cost? And so here in Brunswick County, where land is cheap, housing is cheap, everything's cheap. For all intents and purposes, if it fails a perk test, it's worthless. But 
let's just say 20, 30, 40 years from now, this all gets built out. There's only a couple lots left. Well, you can put money into it, whether it's just bringing in fill or through a very engineered septic. There, there's a lot of solutions. You can always get a lot to perk, assuming it's not, you know, just too small to fit anything. So that is important to understand, but not really applicable here. Okay, a couple more points I want to make. Going back to Pueblo, in my first couple dozen deals, I remember getting a lot under contract on Wild Bill Hickok. It's somewhere up here, forget exactly where. And I had been buying and selling these one acre lots and Wild Bill was 1.7. And I thought, great, 70% larger. It's going to be worth at least close to 70% more. Wrong. It was worth $0 more because in this market, people didn't really care. They wanted a little bit of space, about an acre, but there was little to, to really no premium for a 70% larger lot. And this is a sharp contrast to Palm Bay. One of the first land deals I ever did in Palm Bay was a little bit larger. It was surrounded by 10,000 square foot lots and this one was maybe 12. And I thought, oh, okay, this was my point of reference, right? This is where I had done the first 30, 40 deals. That probably doesn't matter, right? Turned out it made a substantial difference on price because in Palm Bay, you have a lot of builders in a lot of small lots and those slightly larger corner lots allowed builders to fit a larger floor plan. I just sold a lot in a different market in Florida where holiday builders is big and they bought the lot specifically at a premium because it was a corner lot and allowed them to fit a floor plan that did not fit on the standard lots in that market. So again, that illustrates the point over here. I get a lot that's 70% bigger and it adds zero value, whereas here I get a lot that was barely 2,000 square foot bigger and it added like 40, 30 or 40%. I don't remember the exact numbers, but the concept remains. And so, again, I wouldn't have known that if I didn't have a local realtor that told me that and told me what builders were looking for here. And so that comes to the point of price per acre when you're getting into acreage. Again, if you haven't done business somewhere, if you don't have a local expert, you don't know when the price per acre is going to start going down because there's always a discount for whole, uh, wholesale, right? If I go buy a pack of waters at Costco versus one bottled water at a gas station, that one bottled water is going to be you know 20x what each piece or each bottle is worth out of that pack. And so when you're looking at land, well, if I go buy 400 acres in any market, it's going to be X per acre. And if I chop that up into five acre pieces, I'm sure those are going to be dramatically higher price per acre, but you never know what threshold that changes until you have experience in the market or you go find a local realtor, right? Is, are, are the five acre pieces and the 10 acre pieces identical price per acre? Or does it start going down after five or is it identical up to a hundred? Totally depends on the market. Totally depends on what customers or consumers are looking for. And you can't know this on your own. OK, uh, one couple more points that I, uh, I want to make here are around top uh, topography, flood zone, wetlands, uh, crappy roads, all of this. And guys, I'm pulling from real examples of submissions we've gotten where people were making assumptions that were not correct because they were using the market they'd been in or uh, by them and then applying that to some other market or using their own point of reference. Going back here, the roads are really bad here in a lot of these areas. And people will come down from Denver, or Colorado Springs and say, oh, so nobody must want to live here. <laughs> nope. There you'll find. We, we I just went by like a seven or $800,000 house over here being built that someone bought. The roads are terrible, but they all have trucks. They don't really care. And so in some places, that's going to really detract from the land value and the house value. Some places... They don't really care. It's the demographics. People are more country. They're just concerned about having space, it being quiet, and being away from other people. They don't care about the road. So whether or not that matters depends on the market because there's some markets where that matters a lot. There's a deal we're buying in Florida where that whole market, that's one of the major considerations. Is it a paved road or is it a crappy dirt road? Okay. And then this all applies as well to flood zones and wetlands where some markets, 
it'll totally kill the deal. It'll really devalue the land if it's in a flood zone. And then other markets, everything's in a flood zone. And so it just doesn't matter. Or maybe most of it's in you know one flood zone and then small parts are in worse flood zone and only matters if it's in the worst flood zone. Same thing with wetlands. There's a number of subdivisions here where everything's covered in wetlands and flood zone. And so it's all the same. And so you can't just make these, oh, okay, if it's in a flood zone, I don't buy it. You can, but you're going to miss deals because many markets, everything's in a flood zone. And so that's just normal, right? And so uh, I'll kind of end the rant there because I think I've made the point where you can't know any of this until you start to talk to locals. And so what I do or have my guys do, my acquisition guys, when we're somewhere new, I was going to show the flood hazard and wetland here, but it doesn't want to load. <clears throat> what I do is twofold. If you scroll around listings and look at what everybody is mentioning, you get an idea what is important, what everyone is looking for, right? And especially look at the ones that sold. Does every single lot that sold say active septic permit? Or does it just say preliminary soil evaluation? What are people looking for? That's a great way to know. And then number two, when we're in a new market, I always have my guys ask local realtors, well, you know, John, we're new to this area. What could trip us up? What could make land worthless or really devalued that we might not know because we've never done business here? That question has saved us and made us a lot of money. So guys, create a market-specific due diligence sheet. Get to know your local metros and always assume there's something you don't know in new markets uh, and, and you can't always apply the metrics, the heuristics you use from one place to another because they vary so dramatically.